have a fisheries uh, sector, which is mostly currently marine uh, based. So we, what we are, we are, our functions to ensure that we have sustainable harvesting practices to ensure the sustainability of the sector. That is to ensure that we won't overfish and we will have this industry for a long time to come. So we try to ensure that the, the fishermen, they do um, best fishing practices. And we have um, our marine sector, we have three, um, three type of fisheries. Uh, no, I should say four because we have a, um, a new one. We have the industrial where we target our shrimp, we call it Seabob. We have the semi-industrial where we target red snappers. And then we have the artisanal, that is the boats you see along the, the sea walls. And those, they target mostly fish, fin fish. And then we have a relatively new um, fishery, it's tuna fishery. So we regulate those um, in the marine. And then we have aquaculture. The total um, production, more it uh, hovers um, 35 to 45 metric tons. Um, what um, the total exports, the value of exports, um, averages around 70 million US dollars. Um, uh, with fisheries, you would sometimes you see a spike. Sometimes you, you don't see like you know because it's due to the fact that um, you might have. Uh, a bad year, you might have some piracy attacks. You have a rise in the cost of inputs. You might have um, some um, bad weather out there or so, you know. Or if you have a drought, the rain tends to increase your production. So it's it's more or less, it, it, it fluctuates. But it's uh, we are almost uh, one of the biggest um, producers um, in, in the Caribbean, in, in CARICOM, in the CARICOM region. And, um, we have, uh, we have, we would have um, received what you call the Marine Stewardship Council certification. That is like an equal label for the shrimp fishery, and that is um, that is not um, demanded by the importing country. That was demanded by the customers of the uh, of you know the, the, the people who buy our, our shrimp. So we. We, we, one of our activities for Agriculture Month is talking about the export and trade and the regulations that, that are included because there is not, it's not a simple process just to, I mean, to export fish. You have to follow certain regulations. Like for example, the US to take our shrimp out, we have to have what is called a turtle excluded device on the nets. Now, the Americans, they would come uh, almost every year or not every two years to inspect to ensure that this is um that we're complying with with the use of this um this device and they also give us training last year we got a 90 percent approval rate um we would have had to one of the requirements they wanted us to have was at, at sea boarding what that means we have our we call the turtle excluded device ted so we have what we call TED inspectors. Before the boat would go out, they have to examine and pass them, pass them. However, we don't know when they go there, what they do, if they use it or not. So the Americans, they wanted us to have at sea boarding. So what we what we did was um, early this year, we acquired a, a vessel. So the fisheries department now has its own vessel. So it's capable of going out there. Um, we are currently getting up the crew and all of the logistics to get it out. So we will be able to have that part of the requirements um, in hand there. There are also, um, we do monitoring of the vessels, which um, 24 seven, and we also have limited days at sea for them to fish. Currently, we're in a closed season. Every year, we do a closed season for the, the, the sea bob industry. It is, that is one of the most monitored and uh, regulated um, fishery in, in, the, in, the, in Guyana. Aquaculture basically is the rearing of aquatic organisms, whether it be plants or animals, in a controlled environment. 
So when you see a guy go out um, to these open canals and they throw cast at and catch, um, that is not aquaculture. <laughs> those fishes and those canals are free for public for public use and as such it is inland fisheries. Aquaculture is when we make a conscious effort to acquire the, um, the seed stock which we refer to as fingerlings and fingerlings are basically when an egg hatch, a fish egg hatches and that egg um, when it hatches it, it is a fry and then the fry goes, grows into a fingerling and then a fingerling grows into a much bigger fish which is juvenile and then a juvenile grows into an adult. But we only target selling farmers the fingerlings. In order for aquaculture to be sustainable, and we need to close the loop. Closing the loop means we should control breeding, and so we don't have persons going into the wild and remove those. Um, for instance, it is a problem with persons going into the wild and taking hazardous. When they take the hazardous, you're looking about you're looking at disturbing two to twenty thousand potential eggs hatching in the wild. And so if we constantly oh. do that, all right, um, this scenario, we go to catch fish. Instead of just taking the adults or some juveniles, hassle, persons would remove the nest. They remove the nest so that they can eat the eggs, <laughs> right? And so that practice is actually detrimental to the population because we're not allowing a new generation to hatch out. Right? And if we're able to do that at the aquaculture station here and prevent, we're going to provide a relief to the wild and so they're able to generate themselves and we don't lose uh, maybe even to extinction. If it is that we are harvesting at every stage, it is a problem. For instance, if we harvest two young fish and even in the, um, the marine environment, if we don't control the size of this harvest, then for them to regenerate themselves becomes difficult. We're not allowing them to grow to adults and spawn. For instance, our canal right in front here, we keep throwing cast net to get the brood stock. Brood stock is basically a nice adult male and female and we have them together and they breed. And it poses difficult for us to even get that. So it's saying, it is really saying that the environment out there, what we used to have in the past, we may no longer have now. And so, when we are able to bring in a male and female, breed them, and do it in a in a in a um, in an environment that is environment that's welfare conscious to the, to the fishes too. We are stopping farmers from going out there really and to harvest what's there. And right, we might not have the amount that's in the future to secure the um, population. The aquaculture station was commissioned in 2001. On our, apart from this station, the Satidosa Aquaculture Station, we also have an aquaculture station in Region 2, Anna Regino, the Anna Regino Fish Station. And both stations were developed to support farmers, aquaculture farmers, whether it be fish or shrimp, and even to the extent of doing aquatic plants. The stations were developed primarily to do fingling production, um, to do conduct basic research, extension services, and training. The extension services are free and they entail us, um, the potential or existing farmers can call or visit and ask for us to visit their sites. Uh, we do site selection, pond construction and preparation, feed and feeding, what quality management, harvesting, species selection, um, record keeping. All of this is free. We do also test their water for basic stuff like ammonia, nitrate nitrates, the pH levels, dissolved oxygen. In terms of training, we would visit the regions and based on their needs, we would conduct training on tilapia management, tambaki management, hassa management, uh, feed formulation and development, and just to name a few. Uh, we also do fingerling production, and the fingerling production currently is the Jamaican red tilapia, and we also do the Nile tilapia. We're working on breeding Hassa and the Tambaki or the freshwater Paku. We use those ponds for fingerling production, particularly um, tilapia production. So we put a male and one male to three females. They will um, produce 
eggs. Those eggs basically are kept in the uh, female's mouth and she will incubate them, they will hatch and then we'll grow that to two months and sell it to farmers for $14 for one. The pot was still in its infancy stage. We were able to um, harvest a lot from a pond from one of our farmers and so we allow those to grow into adults and then we'll separate them using a sex ratio three to one, have them breed, and then based on the fingerlings coming off, we can sell those to farmers. And so it will be a continuous cycle. Those that are interested in, in pato production. We would let our existing farmers know, persons that are coming in to us, potential farmers, that we have that available. And if they're interested, yes, we have a list and we provide according to the list. So what's the first come, first serve. <laughs> This is our hatchery. In the hatchery, we use this facility to condition brood stock for breeding. Um, we have incubators, hatched eggs, and then grow out, um, fries the fingerlings. Here is one of our um, product, the red Jamaican tilapia fingerlings that we offer to farmers at $14 for one. Um, this here is the patwa that we're currently working to provide fingerlings for farmers. This is the adult, male and female, that can produce those fingerlings for us. These are the Nile fingerlings, and the Nile fingerlings come from the Nile parents. And here we have the adult red Jamaican tilapias that will produce the, uh, the um, Jamaican red fingerlings. On this side here, we have the Arapaima. So the Arapaima in some countries is actually an aquaculture species. In Guyana right now, it is an endangered and protected one. And so again, we're talking about um, relieving pressure in the wild. Persons, even though they're not, it's not legal to, to harvest the arapaima unless the Armenian villages have a quota, uh, a quota that they can harvest. It is illegal for the persons to do so. So what we're looking to do is firstly look to maybe repopulate the wild Right, repopulate the wild and then look to move it from an endangered and protected species to one that can become an aquaculture species. Because we were able to have these feed on artificial feed, which is a major um, win for us. Because the arapaima would normally feed on other fishes. And so it's an unsustainable practice to feed fish to feed us. Right? <laughs> so if we can move to having them use an artificial pellet, then we minus the, um, the, feed, the fish that you would feed to the arapaima, they can go towards human consumption. In this tank we have tambaki adults, and these tambaki adults we can use to breed and provide tambaki fingerlings. We're currently working to do so along with um, the hasatu, breed those hasatu to produce fingerlings for farmers. Aquaculture globally is the fastest growing industry, one of the fastest growing industry. And so for Guyana to tap into that market, to provide countries that have overfished and overexploited their wild capture fisheries, Guyana can tap into that by providing um, a relief really. The largest aquaculture region for us is Region 6. They do brackish water shrimp and they, we have about 31 farmers there. Um, the other regions, we have one and two persons. Uh, our largest freshwater farmer is in region two. We are currently working on, our, on strengthening our aquaculture and inland regulation and to renew our strategy. So efforts are being made in collaboration with the FAO to get that um, started for next year. So we have a regulation in place and the industry is managed and enforcement is there. And we have a strategy with clear, with clear directions. Now the strategy would have, well this is consultation period for us. The consultants are out there speaking to uh, all the relevant stakeholders. But broadly what we would like to see in the strategy is aquaculture formulation of feed development. Now feed contributes 60 to 70 percent of cost of production. And so it makes the operation unsustainable and uncompetitive when we're looking at major players on the market like China. And so if we're able to get the feed cost down, then our farmers stand a better chance locally, regionally, and then moving internationally. Uh, we conducted last year and into this year, um, utilizing seafood processing byproduct, basically 
For fishes, it's everything they take off the fish that is not edible. The head, the guts, the scales. And we made uh, fish meal and we made fish silage, powdered fish silage. And so those two have very high protein and is a good addition to the um, fish feed. With the shrimp processing industry, we were able to use the head, the tail, the shells and so to make shrimp meal. And so if we have private investors that are interested in going in that direction, because those things are normally discarded, they're not utilized, then we have the opportunity for the manufacturing sector, the input ingredients. We currently are importing from Brazil um, fish feed, but we can, when we have a formulation that we can provide to farmers, then they can also make their own feed. We can have a private investor just run with the formulation and provide to, the, to our local farmers. And our preliminary results, when we compared our feed to the commercial feed, was comparable in, in its performance. greenhouse and this is where we're promoting climate smart agriculture in terms of aquaponics. Aquaponics is the combination of hydroponics which is the growth of plants in um, silos media and aquaculture which is the uh, rearing of aquatic organisms such as plants and animals in this case here fishes the tambaki and the Jamaican red and Nile tilapia. In situations where water is an issue you don't have enough water. The system is very efficient in recycling water. So when it passes through the filter system, it is then safe for the animal, for the fishes, and for the plants. Um, in terms of dealing with the traditional agriculture where you have to go and plow the land and then face the elements of the weather, diseases, pests, and so and then the, in the use of those chemicals to control pests and diseases. This system, you don't use any um, herbicides or insecticides. In a greenhouse, it is protected, so you have the insect mesh, so you don't have insects coming in, and, and the diseases, um, your plants are receiving all its nutrients from the feces. So there are different types of um, aquaponics. There is the water-based system, and so the culture system we refer to it as. And so basically we grow the plants on uh, styrofoam in water. In the media base system we use a solid media. So you can use three quarter stones, you can use sun, uh, inert materials. And then you have the horizontal system which is an vertical system. It's just the bathing of the roots as the water passes through a pipe or a trough. Here this is the um, horizontal system. Over there we have the deep water and the uh, media base. This system, uh, we found that the pak chai and the lettuce grew much faster um, as compared to the traditional agriculture where you use soil. Um, the system also utilizes less water. Um, so we basically recirculate in what we have and we, we top up the water every now and then. But it utilizes far less water than if we were to do it in, um, in a traditional sense. The system also uses no insecticides and herbicides because it's detrimental to the fish. The best type of plants to use are leafy vegetables. Um, tomatoes have grown well, um, lettuce, celery, um, pak choy, yeah, they've all grown well. Broccoli, cauliflower, we have had good um, results with those. inspectorate unit of the Ministry of Agriculture Fisheries Department really is the unit that is responsible for the licensing of all fishing vessels, processing plants and also we provide all of the different um, fisheries with most of the user permit. So once you're going to occupy area within the exclusive economic zone for fishing purposes you would have to come into the legal inspectorate unit to have some kind of permit or some kind of license. Moreover, we try to deal with a lot of the issues related to 
um, fish processing plants, so we deal with large processing plants down to the small cottage industries. Right? We, would, we would be the agency who would provide most of the oversight, um, ensure in tandem with the veterinary public health unit that those facilities are up to the necessary standard to receive um, permits and then most of them subsequently uh, might do some kind of exporting. So we would also process the license for that in tandem with um, the Guyana Revenue Authority. Where it comes to the safety of our fishermen at sea, um, the Legal Inspectorate Unit really is the driving force behind that within the Fisheries Department. Um, we have a lot of collaboration with the different agencies. So we're talking about the Guyana Police Force um, Marine Branch and the Guyana Defence Force Coast Guard. Um, at times we would also collaborate with the Guyana Revenue Authority on some of those exercises out at sea. Um, so that is in relation to piracy. Um, where it comes to imports and exports, um, the Legal Inspectorate Unit has um, the capacity to process all of Guyana's single um, individual exporter license or if we have companies who might be doing export, we also seek that. Um, one of the most important role is that we provide a lot of the, the supplementary information that might be required for improving the regulations with regards to all of the fisheries activities and how we manage the sector. So that is one of our principal role and that is where the legal aspect of our function really comes in. As I said before, the Legal Inspectorate Unit is really responsible for providing licenses. So we do from the artisanal sector right up to the industrial sector. We also include what we consider to be the semi-industrial sector, which are persons who fish within the deep slope area of the exclusive economic zone, primarily for red snapper and things of that nature. Now our industrial fish and vessel fleet um, includes our prawn fishery and also our deep sea fishery, which targets tuna primarily. Um, the most important of the industrial fishing sector fleet um, would be that of the seabob fishery, which recently received its Marine Stewardship Council certification. So licenses are granted on an annual basis, so from January 1st to December 31st, uh, after which each vessel is required to do a new registration, inclusive of their workmen and also if they have any necessary fishing areas. So for example, in the artisanal fleet, they are what we consider to be, um, or what we call um, fish pens. So those fish, pens, fish pen areas are dedicated areas where fishermen would normally come in um, they would pay for this, lease, this yearly acquisition of the area and then they would fish generally with the tides within that area. In terms of the guiding principles for the fisheries department, um, the fisheries department really is governed by what we call the Fisheries Act of 2002. So the Fisheries Act of 2002 is what gives all the fishery officers, um, inclusive of the chief fishery officer, the power to grant access to our fisheries resources as a country. Um, moreover, um, the, the agency is managed um, readily by the regulations. Um, we recently had an update to our regulations in 2018. These regulations have really been put in place primarily with the idea of keeping our fishermen safe. So one of the big changes within that um, regulation of 2018 um, is really the addition of vessel monitoring systems on board most um, fishing vessels. Um, there is a staggered approach in which we expect all of the industrial vessels to be um, having VMS at one particular time, the semi-industrial by one particular time, and then the artisanal. However, I can say that um, this particular time will not exceed um, the year 2025 as we're working with a management plan that extends up to that date. Another key aspect of the Legal and Inspectorate Unit is that um, our licensing process really is the instrument that would allow persons to understand whether the sector has grown or the sector has shrunk. Um, from the last year, uh, 2019, there was a, a slight reduction in the amount of um, fish landed per metric tons. However, the amount of gross revenue earning um, from the department increased. Um, the amount of persons registering as workmen in the fishery sector also increased and the amount of um, fish pen spaces and allocation also increased. The set target for our industrial fleet um, is really capped. So we have um, a, a number of CBOB vessels operating. Um, we usually get about 100% coverage of those licenses. Um, generally, we do between 
55 to 60 percent of all of our registration, whether it be of for new licenses or um, existing fishermen. Well, we are here at the in front of our new vessel, the fisheries department would have acquired this vessel at a cost of $99 million, Guyana dollars that is. And the purpose of the vessel is to assist us in ensuring that we comply with our mandate, which is to regulate and monitor the fishing activities in Guyana. So the vessel basically would be utilized to make what you call at sea inspections of our fishing vessels to ensure that they are using their, their, their fishing gears in accordance to the regulations. It is a very important and significant step because we know that um, the importing countries now, they are have, they're having more stringent regulations, import requirements for our seafood. And one of those requirements include ensuring that we would have made inspections of the the vessels at sea. Because before that, what we would have done, we would have inspected the vessels before they, they would have um, set sail. Uh, but we won't know how what they were doing out there. So with this vessel, it will ensure that we cover that aspect of the of the operations. I mean, in terms of piracy, this is, um, is not um, under the mandate of the fisheries department. But what we do, we serve as uh, what, you, what you call um, People uh, at, at sea, we will, if we have here any incidents of piracy, what we do, we would try to alert the authorities. We are currently hoping to form a, a committee which will handle this in a better, uh, better, a more coordinated way. When we go out to patrol, normally we would, um, we would require, request the presence of a coast guard to, to accompany us, but. In terms of piracy, we are we, we work in collaboration with the relevant agencies. Before the year is finished, we hope to do at least two two patrols, one down up the east east coast and down up to the north 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 coast, um, to to ensure that one the vessel is 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 working perfect order and to ensure to let the fisher folks know that we are out there and we have a new a new vessel on board so so that they will be able to to recognize that they have to really comply with the regulations if they are not doing it so that is what we plan to do for the year and for the rest for the next year we hope to increase our patrols and the boat is capable of going out for uh, four or five days we also have um, our staff will be preparing some research um, research programs so that will also kick in next year when we, when we start with our new uh, budget in 2021. We do roughly 100 tons of fish a day. Very good. Huh? 100 tons of fish. A different, different species. Different species. Remember, we have our own boats. I have 20 red snapper boats, plus I'm having I have a request license for bringing in the Venezuelan to fish for us, okay. 20 license. And in that process, we have the raw materials. Remember, it's the foreign, foreign exchange spin off. You, now, you, when you, a Venezuelan you. come here or a foreigner come here, they don't only come here to sell, they also spin. They go yeah. buy groceries, they go buy everything to take back to Venezuela whenever they're going to leave. All right? Also, whatever they spend here, the community, the benefit environment from benefit. benefit from it. The spin-off, other spin-off effect, we create a consistent market overseas, yeah. right? We do do fresh and ice or we do frozen. And in the process of doing this, we're creating the huge employment for the staff that we have. You know, in any business, what is important, you have to do, you got to evolve with what is no, happening in the world. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. Optimization, I have to mechanization. Definitely. Yeah, so yeah. that you become competitive with that's, the world environment. And it. if you don't do that, You'll be in big trouble, and no, that's, that's why it. you know you have a few companies, and I know you had um, BV. They're out of business. You know the creativeness you have to be, and involvement. I must say to you, I'm involved in everything that I do. I manage. I also involved with the day-to-day -day activities that goes on. No, export, that's very good. Import. You take care of your business. And so look I at do it. with every single thing. You yeah. know, it involves with the business, and I, you know, I'm once more happy. So here that there's a, a return of all the facilities we had 
prior to 2015. Correct. So, so that is a real plus for me. One last that. question. Yeah. What, what about piracy? Do, they don't affect you? I mean, Minister, we have to invest. Okay. What are the things we have? We have cameras on our boat, and mm -hmm. I think there's a facility we put in place. No, why I'm asking this question? Because places like the, the other corps, them around the country, yeah. you have had a number of um, incidents that took place at sea. And, but um, well, I, I have not say, been seeing in the news about like big company like your company being affected or people. Well, I must say to you what I do. Over the years, I came into the business. You know they're steeping. Mm -hmm. There's something in the blood of the captain. You could give them your life and it's still not enough. They right. want more. Right. So what we have done, we introduce cameras on each boat. Oh, cameras on each boat. So when the boat comes in, we have the camera. Denzel would request. Let me see a camera if I'm using my TEDs, if I'm using anything. Okay. The guys would come in. We show them. So when the captain leaves port, we have the camera running. When he comes back, we review. Before I pay you, I review you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right? If so that you don't have that problem. Yeah, you get a good monitoring system. Yeah, so we have that for the red snapper boat, the gray snapper boat. If you're going to help anybody, ask permission. If you're going to brace the next boat, ask permission. Yeah, yeah. There's the penalties behind it, you know? And what we have been doing in this industry is that you try to control almost everything that relates to what you're doing. So what we do, boats, we build our own boats. That's why from time to time, we would have duty-free concession. We build our own fiberglass boat using special nails, bolts, stainless steel, yeah, yeah. everything. So you build it to suit your, your right. business. Exactly. Right? So when you go to the next location, you will see that. So in, in so doing, if you don't protect where you get your daily earnings, you're going to be losing and hemorrhaging all the time. No, no, I agree. Not I agree. denying the fact. In anything that you do, you would have pilfering, but you have to try to control it. Yeah, you would yeah, have to try to control better. it. And they, for example, these artisanal fishermen them, that encounter these problems, a lot of piracy would happen from the other side, which is Suriname. Yes. Right? And those are some of the issues that they, you would experience. Or sometimes Venezuela too. Right. right. And, and what would happen too, the boats that I would have would not be coming more inshore, it would be more offshore. The red snap of boat would be in 250 feet of water, sometimes 300 feet. The tuna boat would be beyond the EEZ. Uh, okay. Sometimes they go on, on far distance running uh, uh, to catch the tuna. Huh? But in, in all, I have tried my best. We have evidences. We had two robberies uh, uh, at high seas, but I can't complain, Minister. As I says, I have to do what I have to yeah, do yeah, to, to set, continue my to, business. I agree. And right. I tell you what happens. Lately, we had an incident. Uh -huh. the, the, the men ransacked the boat. You know what the captain did? They took away everything. We saw it in the video. The guy used to sell out all we seen, bring the boat and gone. Oh, I see. This is part of life. Yeah, so you yeah. can't complain over it. We just make sure he's blacklisted, not to come in the compound, but we continue with business. Yeah. And, and I must say to you, what we do is that everything is overboard, making sure that everybody understands what is really going on. And a captain, at the end of the day, must be satisfied. Yes. The people that work for me must be satisfied. With 1,500 staff over the years, I must say, I am the union, I'm the representative, I'm the financer. I take care of the welfare of my staff. That's good. That's very good. You, you, you don't got an official union here? No. Okay. Because I one time... I 20 believe, years. Believe I know Gao, 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 Gao. we had... Everybody was here to fighting to get it. But oh. it never happened oh. because of the relationship I have with, with the staff. workers. That's yeah. how you treat your workers. Yeah. We have... If you're sick, you're being sent to a doctor. I mean, the managers have a, 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 a sickness benefit scheme which oh, okay. we set up. But the basic workers, if a person's injured, we take care of them. I mean, in any business that we deal with, as long as you treat people well, you have no problem. Definitely. And I do appreciate, you know, um, that I could get all these help to keep me going. No problem, because rest assured, because we want the industry to develop. Our job is to ensure as a government give, give you and facilitate you so that you can continue to create employment. Sure. That's uh, As long as there is employment, then... Uh, poverty will reduce in the country. Exactly, That's and, and the tremendous, there's the tremendous, what I, what I understand, you may lose one way, but the other way is where the, 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 the people of Guyana spends money. That's I mean, you get it in a different way. Yeah. You're not one-sided. You're it. looking at the whole picture.
this operation is a model operation and with the contribution it's making in terms of creating employment for people. We heard just now Mr. Singh said that he's creating employment for over or around 1,500 persons who, have di who are directly involved in operations here. And then you have the spin-off effect where you have a number of other persons who are around the country, not only on the East Bank, but around the country. I am very impressed that people as far as 66 comes here to sell their catches to Mr. Singh. And I hope that, and Eskubo too, I hope when we go around, we will try to also encourage fisher folks, fishermen, and cooperative society to come and get, have a ready market here. That's very important for us. With the investment he's making, this will have a direct effect on the economy. And as uh, he rightly said, that as a government, we recognize the contribution of the fishing industries. That is why we have put measures in place so that we can have those um, those measures that were implemented, harsh measures that were implemented by the previous administration, we now have relief or put relief in place in terms of abolish the VAT and inputs in the fishing industry. We are now, um, as a matter of fact, he will have an, um, those relief, things like this, um, the, the rope, the lead, and those things that he, you normally pay VAT on will now become VAT free so that he can have more money in his pocket and he can make a contribution to his, the welfare of his employee and to, uh, employees and also to the country. So I'm very impressed with the operation here that he has. And he's self-sufficient in terms of he's doing his own, um, his, his own plastic, his own um, electricity, water, ice. So he's, uh, he's having an all-wrong um, development in this um, part here. And I hope that he will continue. He told me that he'll be... Um, he is expanding his operation so that he can create more jobs for people around this community and also create more jobs for people around our country. So I am very impressed with operation here and I want to thank him. And I will be working, our, our ministry, the fishery department, will be working very closely with him so that he can expand and create more employment and create more benefit for Guyanese.